Well, there's a num number of ways. Uh, I guess I'll start out by talking about the way that we do it that maybe is a little bit uh, distinctive um, among business schools. The, uh, I think the, the signature element of our, our school, is our MBA program in particular compared to others, is what we call action-based learning. So right now, for example, all of our 425 first-year MBA students would not be found in Ann Arbor. Uh, they will be uh, scattered around the globe in uh, about 90 teams uh, working on real-world problems. So what we've done to try to differentiate our, our students and really provide value added was uh, probably about 10 years ago, slightly before I got to the school, we instituted uh, what we called this MAP project, which is called Multidisciplinary Action Projects. So we've since built that up and really invested in it as our point of differentiation. And so we source about 120 projects a year from, uh, from around the world of three different types. We have corporate ones, which would be like with a Fortune 500 company, entrepreneurial and nonprofit ones. And then after the students take the required curriculum from August through uh, the end of February, in March and April, the only thing they do is one of these projects. So right now, we has, as I was saying, we have all of our first-year MBAs out working on these real-world projects uh, uh, around the globe. So about half of them are outside the United States. And our thinking on that has been that um, clearly business schools have to be close to the world of practice. And you can get there a couple ways. One, is, one way is to try to import the business world into your school via, for example, case studies or, as we have done, recreating a trading floor that you'd find here in New York or another uh, uh, finance center in the world and bringing that into the school. The other way is you can take your students and your faculty and put them out in the world of practice. And so that's what we've done, uh, it really to try to uh, distinguish our program. And it, it's, it's a really great way of educating students and also a great way for us as the school to see what the interesting problems are out there in the world because in the course of having the students do these projects, we probably visit about 150 companies a year to ask them if we could do a project with them of something that's really salient for them today. So we get a pretty good sense of sort of what's on people's minds by the kinds of things they would like our, our students to work on. So I think that injection of our students and our faculty out into the world of practice on a full-time basis for two months of the, of the required curriculum in the first year, and we're doing this over and over and over. And so we're able to actually get a look at some, um, some problems in detail. So for example, a few years back, um, C.K. Prahalad, who's on our faculty, decided he really wanted to take a look at the issue of can businesses profitably serve the poor of the world? And so the basis for his getting a look at that question was to do 10 map projects with companies, or mostly nonprofit organizations, around the world. And that really was the raw data which became his book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. So I think in the way that uh, some other schools would try to have their connection with the world of practice be by bringing in outside speakers and making sure the faculty will bring current events into the classroom. We do all that the same as any of the leading business schools would. But I think this is what's really kind of been distinctive for us and has really been terrific in terms of a, a way for us to see what the interesting problems are in the world, for our faculty to be out there, and also for our students really to be solving real world problems and all their ambiguity and uncertainty that I think uh, has really been a hallmark of the school. Well, I think it is necessary to have a, a global presence in, in some way or another. And, uh, you know, you can do it in a number of ways and various schools ha have chosen different routes. Harvard Business School, for example, has chosen to set up research centers all around the world. Northwestern has chosen to do educational programs in cooperation with, with other schools. What we've done so far is really n uh, not to engage in partnerships with other, uh, with other schools around the world because we find that you sometimes don't have a perfect alignment of, of the agenda. So, so f at the moment, what we have is a, we have a research center in India. We have a, uh, 
We have a global MBA program that we run in, in Korea and China. And the major way that we go global is through these MAP projects and other global, uh, global projects courses. So I think, I personally believe it's really important for the students to experience a particular culture. I was in India in uh, last December, and I think just what you can learn from uh, intelligent observation of what's going on is really important. So we intend to be uh, as a platform for more of our action-based learning work outside the United States. We'll be establishing more uh, kind of small bricks and mortar investments. I don't think it's particularly useful to be going to another country and staying in a classroom and just studying in that classroom. What's important, I think, is to get immersed into the local economy. So whereas some schools are going global via, via setting up executive MBA programs around the world, I haven't seen much value in that to the students who are back at ho on, on the home campus. So our strategy is much more to figure out ways to get our full-time students who would be enrolled in Ann Arbor to get them out and have a global experience. So we'll be expanding on the um, MAP project activity. And I think to have a presence in country to help us with the sourcing of those projects and to, to help us with admissions of students from those countries to our uh, campus in Ann Arbor. Those are useful investments that we'll be making and expanding over the next few years. I didn't stay doing the uh, case math for 21 years if I didn't wasn't a proponent of it in some ways, but I think a sole reliance on it can be uh, can be a um, can be a limitation, and that's why when we were trying to figure out okay how do we really differentiate our school, it's not that we don't do any case studies. They are a tremendous device for developing students' problem solving skills, which are really uh, which are really valuable. But on the other hand, when you talk to companies, as I spent the majority of my first year doing as, as dean, going out and talking to companies and say, look, what really distinguishes your great people from your, from your good people? It was never, well, so-and-so is a great problem solver. It was always, well, so-and-so is the person who is able to see things that other people can't see. And he's also the person that when everybody else is saying, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We have nothing that we'll possibly be able to do to, the, uh, to solve this uh, issue. He or she is the one who's able to say, well, look, actually we have, th there's three different things we could do. So trying to think about, well, what do you, how could you develop the skills that go on the front end of a case study? That you develop students' ability to make sense of the situation and then really frame the problem. And so that's what we've tried to do with our action-based learning projects where as we send students out for a two-month project, there is no case. We give them a one-page description of the problem and many times the problem is when you really look at it, it's saying, well, go help this company figure out how they could do better. So we deliberately leave the job of defining what the issues are and providing the students the space to really find the opportunity in the situation. So I a believer that the three fundamental ways that you can think about education, there being a professor up front lecturing, telling you what he or she has inside their head. Secondly, some case studies in which you are, are in discussion for them, and then also an action-based learning. Combining those three in the right way is what I think is the right way to do uh, both MBA and BBA education. Well, that's, uh, I guess that's my, what I think of as my, my primary job. And uh, I guess the, uh, a couple, well, a few, a few kind of everyday ways and a few uh, maybe a l little bit uh, kind of more abstract, I guess, uh, abstract ways that, that, I, that I try to do it. But I mean, in terms of trying to create a, a, a learning community, one, one of the things we try to do is uh, create a physical space to, uh, to accommodate a, a learning community. And so in our new building, what we have is it's all built around what we call the Winter Garden, which is where about 450 people 
will be sit, seated from about, gets going about 10 o'clock in the morning and it goes till about one o'clock at night. And so that's sort of the, the heart and soul of our, of our community. And I think the, uh, so that's one, is to have the physical infrastructure there. The second thing is from the beginning to be telling students about what their job is at the school. That, you know, our first test when we're deciding whether to admit you to the school or not is um, can you learn in this environment? So we don't do you any favors if you don't have the analytical skills to deal with the statistics courses or the business economics courses and so forth. But we're fortunate enough that we can fill the school up 10 times over with people who can learn effectively in our environment. So we get to create a situation where we're really choosing the students to join our environment based upon what we think they can teach the rest of us. So the idea of having a diverse student body in you know, gender, race, national origin, what kind of activities they've been involved in in the past, it really gives us the opportunity to think not of having 180 teachers, which is how many tenure, tenure track faculty we have, but if we think of ourselves as having 3,000 teachers, uh, because that's what our student body plus our faculty together. So I'm always trying to stress that we are a learning community. When we talked about uh, building our new facility, it was never about we're trying to build a great teaching facility. It was we're trying to create a great learning facility by having 3,000 uh, people who really have a teaching burden uh, for, the, for the rest of us. So those would be two. I guess the third one is you're always trying to attract uh, people who are going to bring excitement and intellectual curiosity into our classrooms and, and our environments. And then I think the fourth, fourth thing is that you're really trying to create something uh, which has a high degree of excitement to it that we're always out there pushing new boundaries. And we had our prospective MBA students in uh, a couple weeks ago and I was talking to them about what I thought was some of the different things about the school that maybe they wouldn't see by reading our brochures. And I told them the story about when I was, I was on a panel of three deans talking to new PhDs and young faculty members from around the country about what does a dean do? And it was, you know, it's kind of an interesting question because faculty typically haven't really seen it very much up close and say that they don't know. And, uh, so the two deans ahead of me spoke about, well, basically what we have to do is we have to manage budgets and we have to make sure the priorities of the university are aligned with the school, and you know, which is something that I have to do, but it's not how I think about my job. And so I, so I told them that what I said to the audience was, well, how many Neil Young fans do we have in the audience? And, and there were lots of Neil Young fans, so I said, well, you know, one of Neil's songs on Heart of Gold DVD is about going out and uh, hunt uh, with his dog named King. And he said he loved his dog named King because he wasn't afraid of jumping off the truck in high gear. And I thought, well, you know, in some sense, that's maybe the most important thing that a dean can do is create an environment in which you can take sensible risks and, uh, and really bring so much excitement and energy into the into the day-to-day -day life of the school. And, you know, I had a finance professor come to me a couple of years ago and said, uh, I'd like to create a new course on sustainable finance. And I said, well, what what is it? He said, well, I'm, I'm not sure. He said, but it's something which is going to marry all of these concepts of sustainability with the world of finance. And so we said, yeah, we'll go, we'll go make that bet. And so I think it's the idea of, being willing to do some experiments, being smart enough to come back around a couple of years later and look at the flowers you've planted and see whether they're blooming or not. But I think to try to create a, a, a place that it's, uh, the academic world is great in the sense that, you know, the, the cost of an experiment is fairly low. And so we have to be creating a situation where we're going to go try things that you wouldn't be able to try other places. So, so I think it's always trying to inject that sense of excitement into the day-to-day -day kind of learning activities. Mm -hmm.